so I'm a professor and I work at the research lab for archaeology at the University of Oxford. But I'm also a parkour practitioner, which is also known as professor, and a parkour instructor. Uh, my name is James, and I'm a research assistant in the Zoo Archaeology Lab at Cambridge, and I don't do parkour. <laughs> <laughs> Pathfinding and pathfinding, and we're going to do so uh, basically by explaining to you what parkour is, and also why we're talking about parkour in a skateboard session. And then we're actually going to explore parkour as a culture, and then parkour and issues such as landscape, mobility, and embodied practice, and finally finish with some final thoughts. Yeah. I think it's just going to be a sort of bit of a back and forth dialogue kind of thing, is what we're going for, and, and occasionally bring it back to archaeology sometimes. So we'll see how it goes. So, James, as a known practitioner, what do you understand by parkour? Uh, well, before I learned what parkour was from yourself, I guess uh, I always felt that parkour was about getting from A to B, moving between two points in a landscape, usually an urban landscape, and either about getting from somewhere as quickly as possible, which is why you don't go on the pavement, or uh, alternatively, you know, doing flashy things like urban gymnastics kind of thing was what I was kind of Yeah, thinking. so it's kind of like, it's basically the aim of general ideas to move across the landscape in a way that's not necessarily as efficient, but as effective as possible. But there's also a much deeper meaning to parkour for some of us practitioners that we really relate to, and this is Alex Mayn, but she put it really well, and I'll just read it for you. So, parkour is about the process, it's not about the outcome. It isn't about whether you can jump a certain gap, do a certain move, and whether you're comfortable at height or not. Parkour culture on the whole seems to think that's what matters, but that's not actually the case. Um, it's about how you try and how you train. Parkour is a process of self-overcoming, using movement, including around urban routes and challenges, as a tool to become better. Better in what? Well, overcoming obstacles of the non-physical sorts, learning to deal with fear, building resilience, growing in confidence, and finding your weaknesses and grappling with them. And also just about having fun and solving puzzles. Hmm. So I guess we've already kind of seen hints at like why we're here talking about parkour in a session that's about skateboarding, <laughs> but um, I mean, you, you have some other similarities that you want to... Yeah, to we're thinking basically, um, well, both of us are quite recent in terms of like um, timeline, as I said, skateboard became really popular back in the 1970s. In terms of parkour, it was actually, <coughs> the term was born in 1996, but the sport was around much earlier on. And we found both, both sports basically use their landscape to move across, uh, use their urban environment to move across the landscape. And we also kind of like use very similar environments. So what I like in those pictures is that we both use rails a lot, for instance. Um, and what I also like, there's one picture that I really enjoy, it's this one. So you combine the two pieces together. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a certain unity between soccer and football as well in the way we are perceived by communities. We're usually seen as kind of intimidating people and people who persecute the landscape, basically. Uh, we kind of all categorize them in the same it's kind of like label which shows there's some misconceptions between how people perceive us and how we perceive us now mm. as well. So, I mean, they're both ways of traversing your landscape, usually an urban landscape, and there are some similarities in terms of, of uh, how people think about these things, both externally and from within these groups. But, I mean, the one key difference we did think about is that uh, perhaps skateboard is quite an exclusive medium through which to experience your landscape, whereas parkour it has a body of expertise. You can be trained in parkour so that you actually know what you're doing, but it is a more immediate connection in some respects because you're just interacting directly through your body. So in some respects, maybe it's more accessible. Yeah, it's like we always, we want all on parkour as children, for instance. It's just as you grow older, you tend to lose that. <coughs> um, but yeah, it's just something that anyone can do. But when we, we started thinking about, you know, skateboarding has a very famous cultural baggage um, and I think parkour does too it's just maybe less well known less uh, seen visible everywhere but there are some similarities there as well right? yeah it tends to view ourselves as communities so there's a community it's never about competition it's about being supportive and showing that people do what they can do within their abilities <coughs> and never pushing someone beyond the limits and actually it's part of kind of like we can call the code in a way we have like several of those and one of them is do no harm and another is be strong to be useful which was actually written by George Heber about a century ago but it's basically this be strong in order to help people or to like to, to be useful basically 
mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a general something that links us together. Yeah, I think the parallels, you know, coming in, why are we talking about parkour and skateboarding are obviously a lot more obvious, but we have a similar thing perhaps to an extent with archaeology, you know, the public who aren't familiar with what we do as archaeologists have particular stereotypes of who we are and what we do. Some of them aren't always particularly flattering and we have to contend with those. And then we also have our own mentality, our own identity, our own idea of who we are within broader society and what we do and what we're for. And so in a sense there are parallels, as you could argue, with any cultural group, I suppose, any community between archaeology and parkour. But then we thought we'd talk a bit more uh, about what we might actually be able to learn as archaeologists from thinking about parkour and we thought one of the, the key things was exploring mobility and how people move and how they <coughs> use their body and think with their body. Yeah, so basically this is like when you find human-like fossils for instance, you tend to think of or you tend to interpret the mobility of that individual by how we move as like modern humans in this modern society, basically just <coughs> running or walking, so like terrestrial. But you can't completely forget every other part of that movement as well. And this is like uh, this was a research done by Crawford in 2014, where they were like, well, <coughs> let's just have a look at the human capacities <coughs> of actually climbing trees. And so they compared hunter gatherers and the ways they were climbing, the speed, the more mortality rates with uh, other primates. It turns out it's pretty much it's kind of the same in terms of when you scale everything down to like this when you take into account that uh, humans hunter gatherers with like spend much less time in trees, but the way they climb and everything is basically the same as the planets. And so I think what I like about parkour is that compared to like tree climbing, which is basically upwards, or like walking or running, which is in any directional, parkour really moves across the landscape in all kinds of directions. And I think this is something that makes us aware in terms of when you see, when you look at human-like fossils, just to be aware that all these movements that that particular individual could have done, not just the one that we know we can do as humans, because there's so many more movements that we can do. Yeah, and I think uh, I think that that really comes out in the next clip. It's this idea that uh, if it opens, mm. oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> Bear with us. Um, this idea that uh, you know we tend to think of being bipedal, walking upright, is our crowning achievement as a species, you know, this is what makes us special and actually we can still move in a lot of the ways that we see other primates moving, we just don't necessarily explore them on a day-to-day -day basis and this is a little bit contrived but it nevertheless <laughs> gets, the, gets the point across. <laughs> so. I mean, you can think about this in terms of uh, pathology, you know, people all like to look at javelin throwers for understanding how spear throwers do stuff, but we could equally look at this for understanding how early hominins or, or ancestral hunter-gatherers maybe traversed across the landscape, fleeing from predators, chasing down prey, that kind of stuff, perhaps. Who knows? Yeah. It's like every single one of those moves really having like a definition as well, like um, just the terminology and a very precise technique. But I find amazing just the similarity between animals, like the moves we do, and when you look at how animals move across the landscape. That's not a monkey. <laughs> there, were, there is, well, yeah, there was a sound, but a uh, yeah. song, but it didn't, yeah. So, um, yes. Okay. Back in here? Yeah. So, I mean, beyond thinking about how we move and how we use our bodies, there's also the issue of how we uh, interact with our surroundings. <clears throat> On the right here, we have a slide from Durham University where Ophelia and myself both did our PhDs, and that's the path to the library from the science site. Uh, they concreted all this over, but people continued to go the shortest possible route, which was over this island of grass by the tree and you can see the footpath erosion where uh, this has happened and they recently just put in a bin here, now they could put that bin anywhere but it strikes me that they put it there to try and discourage people from using this path and uh, 
to me that's a challenge it's it's a implicit challenge to how I use this landscape I'm no longer okay to walk that way you know I mean I can do but it's it's quite obviously a sign but it's a different challenge to someone like you isn't it I mean I think you can read the landscape the way I do but <laughs> for me it's like I see something like this and I think oh what kind of walk can I do over to get over in a fluid way so can I do a speedboat can I do a cat pass so it's a completely different like perceptions and actually I was thinking just coming into this room there's so many challenges that actually are available around here it's like a completely different kind of like perception of the landscape. Yeah. It, it creates a sort of tension though, doesn't it? Because I mean, this is, this is clearly designed to stop people going there, not to encourage people. <laughs> but um, we thought a bit more about it and we thought, well, you know, this is actually something that perhaps we, we take a very sort of normative approach to looking at settlement layouts and structural layouts when we, when we uh, excavate um, past civilizations. We don't necessarily know how people uh, perceived their own settlement or the, the, the layout of the land as such and, and, it, and it goes even further because when we excavate buildings we always excavate with these sensibilities in mind we're almost predetermining to an extent what we're going to see we see a staircase so we ex excavate down the side of the staircase and I don't think that we should necessarily abandon that and we should go for a parkour route and just oh we'll go smash through this wall but it, it just opens your eyes to a few possibilities of this stuff and when we, we thought about, you know, well, how, does, how do you think about parkour with regards to doing archaeology, we realized that our final and, and my favorite point personally is the idea that both archaeology and parkour are embodied practices. And we found this definition of what an embodied practice is online, and I think it really hit you, right? Yeah, for, for me, it was just like basically <coughs> suggest that we live and experience the world through our bodies, and it's like that's exactly where you see an estate in your, your other environment. You're like, how can I make the most of it? How can I go through a cross landscape and using my body, knowing my abilities, and how can I do it in a way that I feel really comfortable with? And really, yeah, that could really hit me. Yeah, I think it's, it's perhaps more obvious to that definition for someone who does parkour, and I think it's a very raw emotional like connection with a statement like that but archaeology kind of is too you know archaeology isn't the past isn't waiting there to be discovered we create our knowledge about what happened in the past we decide ultimately what happens even if we don't want to own up to that responsibility and so that's what makes us archaeologists that's what the difference between us and historians are whether you're in a library or a laboratory or in the field you are doing archaeology you are going through this process whether you're aware of it or in tune with it or not that's so archaeology is also in a sense an embodied practice and, and um, I think that's something we both share in common and, and following on from that I mean with the initial idea that parkour is a process archaeology is a process it's not just the final result it's not just a flashy performance it's actually performative so we thought we'd end with a video clip of well you can talk through this this is you if I can actually get it to is it gonna play? <clears throat> oh, hang on. No. Ah. Oh no. This played fine earlier. We had a video. Uh, I don't know how to get it to play on here, but um, it was it was just. So basically, it was like it's a signed. Yeah, I'm not sure how you. Maybe you can talk through. Im imagine. Use your imaginations, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> not really much bigger than this area and you have like a wall here and a rail that the sea goes from here to there and it's basically just like some it's on the side um, in the side in the side of the building but no one really uses it. I'm not even sure why it's actually there in terms of like what we use it for. But as officials we just go there and we can spend hours just there exploring the different ways of moving around the rails basically even though you have so many movements that you can do and how does your body flow and how do you keep the momentum without like breaking the flow of your movements and just like really exploring everything as your skills get better get better as well. So it's kind of like it's not just about massive jumps and everything, it's also just focusing on one small part of the landscape, but one small place. What can you extract from it? What can you discover about yourself and about the landscape? And I think the video file was on my laptop and it's embedded and I didn't think to put the video file across so I apologise for that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just an example of I always thought of parkour as running across the landscape and doing flips like we saw in the earlier clip and it's just an example of just exploring the many, many different things you could do with a 
part of the urban landscape that nearly everyone else would just walk past and maybe even try and avoid and it's just really fascinating to see how you see things differently and I think that's what struck us was that as archaeologists you can't unlearn what you've learned you see the world differently you don't realize it because it's how you see it all the time but you see heritage you see earthworks yeah. you see potential in places where you wouldn't normally so I, I yeah yeah and basically for me like that's the kind of like message that I got out of us doing this like study of the research is basically for me, Parkour is a way to highlight yeah, the fact that the perception of certain things, or of like perception of our interpretation, our, um, our contemporary interpretation. Um, this is not just about how we see it in terms of our own societies, it's also how do the other people actually view it as well. There's so many other possibilities of seeing a landscape, of using a landscape. Um, and so need to the human like fossil, it's not just about walking in one direction, it's also actually thinking there might have been so much more to it. And for me, Parkour just highlights the fact that we should be aware of this, basically. Yeah, I really agree entirely. There are various parallels you can draw which, which may or may not be useful for, to do so, but, uh, but overall there's actually just some interesting <coughs> ways of thinking about the past and also being reflexive about ourselves as a discipline that we can get from this and I guess that's where we'll end. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much to the organizers as well.